Municipal governments are comprised of local elected officials and encompass a range of administrative bodies, including cities, towns, villages, and municipal districts. Join us in the Political Trenches Local Government at Work as we examine the most pressing issues confronting municipal governments throughout Canada. I, along with my co-host Ian McCormick, President of Strategic Steps Incorporated, will provide insights and perspectives on the challenges and opportunities that confront local governments as they strive to serve their communities. Today, we bring you the letter I, which stands for intergenerational. Later on in the episode, we'll be speaking with the father and daughter who both have entered into the political trenches. But first, we follow up with a recent Alberta Provincial Inspection Report from Chestermere, Alberta. We will then talk about a Manitoba mayor who had her mayoral powers restored by the Manitoba's Appeals Court. And later, Saskatchewan Association of Rural Municipalities is looking for the next generation of municipal councillors and mayor. But first, Ian, how are you? Good, how are you doing? Any better, I'd be twins. Another great episode <laughs> ahead of us here. Of course. Uh, so Ian, I want to jump into the very first story, and this is sort of a follow-up from a story that we talked about later on earlier in our series, and that is when a province steps in and conducts an inspection of a municipality. Now, in the province of Alberta, the city of Chestermere was put under an inspection after public and administration concerns were raised with the province. Former guest of the show, George Cuff, conducted an inspection of the city of Chestermere. And on March 15th, the province, along with George, publicly announced the findings of the inspection. In, the, in it, the province laid out 12 directives that the city had to complete, and the province said that they would be appointing an official administrator to work with the council until the end of 2023. Now, Ian, you've conducted these inspections. Was there anything surprising to you? You know, in the process, I suppose probably not. The, at the beginning of it all, it's laid out in legislation. Um, there are some terms that are expected by the province about how a local government will operate. And if those things aren't present, then there are some issues, obviously. When an inspection like this is conducted, there's always something that will be found. And in that way, the municipality will be, hopefully be better off afterwards. The one thing that was a little bit different, well, maybe two. One is, first of all, this is the first municipal inspection since 2018. So we've got about five years between inspections, and that's gone through two subsequent provincial governments. So it's not even a, a political thing. Um, we've done maybe half a dozen of these, but none since 2018. This one then must have been quite significant for the province to use this tool, which is quite, quite, uh, quite a significant tool in terms of power. You made a reference to things like appointing an official administrator, for example, to oversee council decisions. The other unusual thing about this is who was actually presenting. Typically, when we have presented a municipal inspection report, we have done it ourselves and had representatives from municipal affairs there. My understanding and people who were at the microphone, the minister was there this time, the deputy was there, an assistant deputy was there, as well as you made a reference to George Cuff, who is very well recognized and admired for doing work like this. So there was a little bit of difference there in terms of the outcome of this thing. That there would be a report doesn't surprise me. In fact, it's required. That there would be recommendations coming out of the report is also something that's typical. The fact there were a dozen directives is something that is perhaps a little bit more atypical. There are it's there are fairly commonly directives, but not often that many. And the difference between a recommendation and a directive is the recommendations are pre presented as part of the report, which would have been accepted by the minister. And they then go to the local government to determine how best to deal with. When it comes to ministerial directives, those aren't optional. Those are things that the minister says has to happen, have to change uh, in order for the municipality to function. And in this case, the minister had said she wants reporting on these things from almost immediate to looking out a couple of years hence. So the differences were at the very front end potentially, and then right at the delivery as well. Other than that, it was a pretty typical in municipal inspection process. Was there anything that jumped out at you? Because when when the the inspection, the public hearing started, the minister said that she respected 
the inspector and she respected the process that the inspection went under. There have been local reports that this was an affair inspection. Does that always happen? Does does is it always uh, municipalities getting their back up that someone from the province is coming in and looking into the the dirty laundry that the municipality may have? Where you stand depends on where you sit. So <laughs> yes, in this case, a majority of members of council were part of a vote, an alleged voting block that was discovered, not necessarily discovered, but pointed out as part of the report, which meant it was a because it was a majority, they would carry council decisions. These inspections can be called either by the minister, by a petitioner's group, or by council. I don't remember exactly how it happened this way, but the, the fact that what came out of it is something that has an impact on the entire city is quite significant. The other thing to this is, I was trying to remember if I have ever encountered a municipal inspection on a city before. Uh, there, now, there was one, I think, in St. Albert, but I'm not sure if that was ministerial or if that was something that was requested by the municipality itself a few years ago. Not coincidentally, George uh, was the inspector in that case, too. So this is a large municipality, a lot of staff, large budget, a significant population base as well. So it's way different than a small rural community, a village, or a small, small populated county or a municipal district, for example. So there are some significant differences. Process is the same, though. Now, uh, I'm going to play this the stupid question here because I don't know what an official administrator is. Now, mm -hmm. they could be different for different organizations, but in this context, what does an official administrator do and how does it relate to municipalities? Sure. Well, the municipal administrator is, is appointed by the province, by the minister. And that person takes on a role that is almost super to council. So in, in a, the, the municipal administrator will review council minutes just to make sure that they're appropriate, review council motions and other decisions to make sure that they are in line with uh, good practice, good governance, good governance, and at very least with municipal legislation. And they are report they report to the, to the minister rather than to citizens or to the council so they have a lot of authority that they can exercise and usually these administrators are people in this case a uh, fellow by the name of Doug Lagoris the administrator and he has had a lot of municipal administration experience around the province too he's not beholden to council or to any of the municipal staff including whoever the CAO or CAOs may be my last question on this because this is the big one what yeah. happens next the public <laughs> report has been tabled the city has these deadlines that they have to adhere to. It was mm -hmm. uh, sort of talked about in that public hearing. What is What happens if they don't uh, actually follow through and follow into some of these? The city yeah. has said that they're going to be speaking to their lawyers and their legal teams about what the report has in some of these directives. But what in the meantime does the city and have to do to adhere to this? Just follow the directives? Yeah, well, basically, essentially, they have to follow the directives. They ought to follow the recommendations. And some of the recommendations are significant enough that they are what the minister turned into directives. If they don't choose to ignore, if they choose to ignore them or don't follow them the way they ought to be followed, the mayor does have the nuclear option of removing members from council, at which point the official administrator takes on a, a bigger role. The minister can remove some or all members of council. Uh, in this case, there was specific mention mayor to, made of the new mayor who has only been on, in office since well, a year and a half or so. Uh, so there were, to me, that is that is um, really something that ought to be looked at pretty closely, is whether the mayor in this case understands the role, respects the role. They have the rules, are they following the rules? And to me, sometimes those are two quite different things. The Manitoba Court of Appeal recently published a decision stating that the councillors in the rural municipality of St. Andrews lacked the authority to strip the mayor of her key responsibilities. The decision states that the councillors were not allowed to pass bylaws that would enable them to appoint another councillor to chair meetings in place of the mayor or take away her powers to chair council meetings. The CBC article says that a bylaw was created in 2020 21 in response to political disagreement regarding a wastewater project in the municipality and the councillor's concerns that the mayor wasn't maintaining order during meetings. Ian, what can councillors do if they believe the mayor isn't doing their job? 
Well, first of all, a mayor is a member of council like any other member of council. So the, the person maintains the same responsibilities, same authorities, plus a few more. So it's like first among equals. So, so fundamentally, for example, there's no way you could remove a mayor's uh, right to vote, fundamentally. The mayor is elected sometimes from within and sometimes at large, and that will have a bearing on the authority as well. Different municipal acts across the country will also say what can happen in terms of sanction, whether that's right in the act, whether that's in a, a code of conduct, any of those sorts of things. The chairing of a meeting is not universal across the country that some uh, in Alberta, for example, uh, and somebody who's not the mayor could chair a meeting. It has happened in places like Fort McLeod, where uh, a mayor had been sanctioned. And that was one of the, the things that was actually taken away from him at the time. And it does happen from time to time. So it varies a little bit, representing the community, uh, going out, uh, committing the community or the municipality to contracts and things is typically not something a mayor should be doing and is often something that, that the uh, councils will, will sometimes check in on. In cases like this, it could just be punitive. It could be a little bit of gotcha. It could have something long seated and historical and cultural in it too. But fundamentally, the mayor, if elected at large, is kind of that first among equals and therefore will maintain some authority unless that authority is stripped by a higher authority, sometimes like the minister or a judge. Well, and, and it brings up a good question that council can't unilaterally decide that the mayor isn't doing their job. They've been elected in that position, I'm assuming. And until the next election, you sort of are not, I don't want to say stuck, but they're mayor until the next election or until they resign or if the province steps yep. in and kicks them yep. out. And some provinces have played around a little bit with recall legislation to get to, to work around that. I'm not a fan of recall legislation and I mean, the bar the barriers to it or the 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 requirement for signatures is really high anyway. But uh, to me, if they're not doing something illegal, and if they are doing well, if they are doing something illegal, the courts will take care of it. If it's something political that is uh, distasteful or that is not popular, that's up to the voters to take care of. The 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 one aspect of this uh, story that I want to get your opinion on is the person who presented this bylaw then went on to run against the sitting mayor in the subsequent municipal election. This happens all the time when there's conflicts of uh, personalities on council. Have you ever seen it taken this far where a councillor tries to strip someone of the power because they may just not like them and they think that they can do a better job? Yeah, that's whether I haven't seen this specific thing before, but it's not terribly uncommon. I think because of the role of ego that plays, and I don't say ego is a bad thing necessarily. You have to believe you've got good ideas or else you wouldn't do this job. The other is that most, if not all, people who get involved in competitive uh, politics like this, as i.e. not acclaimed, will be probably type A people who are always looking to push, looking for change. So you throw those two pieces together and an outcome like this is not a complete surprise. In a bid to maintain a healthy rural municipality government, the Saskatchewan Association of Rural Municipalities, or SARM, is working to recruit the next generation of rural elected officials. According to SARM President Ray Orb, many young people are living in rural Saskatchewan and will make valuable additions to RM councils if they were encouraged to participate. Orb recently announced that SARM is initiating conversations with current members to identify ways to encourage and guide the next generation towards municipal politics. Ian, is municipal government and municipal politics becoming the thing to do after retirement? Well, to me, it certainly is. First of all, SARM, for those who don't know, is the Saskatchewan Association of Rural Municipalities. One of the things I think Saskatchewan is facing that most, if not all of the provinces aren't facing, is the, the, the number of municipalities and having over 600 municipalities in the province means they're looking to staff those boards, if you like, those councils. So they run up against the challenge of just finding the people to, to do what they can to do to fill in those seats. And wanting to look at this as an intergenerational topic or as something that looks to the sustainability of the municipality in the long term makes a lot of sense to me. There are people who seem to think, you know what, I've done my service to my community, I raised my kids, I did my job, I'm retired, and I'm going to sit on council is, is something that that does happen quite a lot. To me, though, I think the ideal council represents the depth and breadth of the community. Part of that is age, uh, well, as well as other demographics as well. So I think it is legitimate that organizations like SARM or other municipal associations across the country would be looking to how do we actually uh, interest 
younger people in coming to be part of local governments, whether it's councils or in some other some other uh, way, particularly when these councils are almost all part time and some of which are very part time. So the time commitment in a, a rural Saskatchewan municipality probably isn't that significant if you take things like driving time out of it. But I think it can be done by people who are younger and maybe more interested in local government over the long term. The story kind of sets up our interview for later on the episode where we're going to be sitting down with a father and daughter team who uh, did enter into the political trenches in two different cities. So we'll be right back after a quick message and we'll be talking to Chris Spearman and Heather Spearman about the intergenerational aspect of politics. Until then. Abuse against municipal officials, elected and staff members has risen dramatically over the past handful of years. And to date, everyone has been dealing with these issues on their own, and often on a case-by-case basis. While we can't eliminate all abuse of officials, we can take steps to mitigate the impact of those instances. On April 27th and April 28th, Strategic Steps Incorporated is hosting a symposium in Edmonton, Alberta, focused on bucking the trend. Attendees will come away with the understanding of fostering a safe space for both administration and council. Learn from industry leaders on how to deal with unsafe and abusive behavior, how to build a supportive team that provides support, and you can walk away with the tools and resources to help avoid abuse in local government. Get your tickets today at buckingthetrend.ca. Welcome to I is for intergenerational on the political trenches, local government at work. The Trudeaus, the Mulroonies, the Fords, the Mannings, the Notleys, the Laytons, the O'Toole's, the Crosby's, the Horners, the Blakey's and the Spearman's. When it comes to politics and the elected office, it can sometimes be intergenerational. And today we are sitting with a father and daughter team who have both entered into the municipal political trenches. Chris Spearman is the former mayor of the city of Lethbridge in Alberta from 2013 to 2021. And his daughter, Heather Spearman, was elected councillor for the city of Airdrie in Alberta in 2021. Chris and Heather, welcome to the political trenches. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I want to start with the first overarching question. Does politics run in the DNA of the Spearmans? Heather, do you want to take that first? Or Chris, actually, let's go with Chris first because he's the father and he entered the political trenches first. Does politics run in the Spearman family? Well, I've always been political. I don't think my parents were political. I don't know of any ancestors that I have that uh, served in political roles. But certainly I was uh, political when I was in university. I formed a a student's association when I was uh, at university to represent student interests. And uh, uh, it started from there. I kind of took a lull uh, when I had a family and uh, began to get back involved as a school board trustee starting in uh, 1992, served for 18 years. And I think uh, from there, I think the kids uh, we're exposed to politics and issues all the time uh, from 1992 until the time they graduate from school. And then each one went their different way. And Heather got more involved and um, the kids were all involved in my in my successful mayor election campaign in uh, 2013. So uh, great to uh, I think that that exposure uh, maybe rubbed off on Heather and gave her some motivation. Yeah, I mean, I, I think when I think back on different different moments in time, um, I remember being in grade seven and running for grade seven school president. Um, so that that was pretty early on. But I think the cool thing about watching my dad go through these processes in a school division and also from a mayor perspective um, was just that it felt really close to home and it was very realistic that someone I know could run and win and be very successful um because dad always had really great numbers behind them i he you took a stab dad at, at running for mayor the first time and 
you did it last minute. It was a surprise race for everybody in Lethbridge. They weren't expecting it. And you still, you didn't, you weren't successful that first time, but you crushed it in the numbers. It was really impressive to see someone do it that way. Um, so it was really interesting. And then seeing him successfully run for mayor again was, uh, was awesome. And, and he always just came out way ahead of everybody else, which was really exciting. And, and he did it with honesty and integrity and he said the hard things. So it, Definitely gave me confidence to say and do the hard things in my community as well. Something I've seen over the last few years, and it's been growing in both intensity and and movement, is the is the lack of respect that is shown towards elected officials, particularly at the local level. And I wonder if you've seen that change over the last fifteen years or so. Your insight on that, I don't know, Heather, if you've you kind of been on the sidelines of that for a while and now you're right into it. What are you seeing in terms of respect or deference even? Um, mm. That's, it's challenging because I think there is a group of people that really are kind of indifferent. Um, And, you know, it really does take a lot to motivate them to get out and get interested and get voting. And even to get someone to volunteer on a campaign is really challenging. Um, During COVID, I had, basically three people on my campaign team and the four of us did all the work um we had a couple of people that joined for you know sticking flyers indoors you can really go door to door and and talk to people because COVID was quite heavy at the time um but just volunteers in general we're seeing a lot less of that um so the, the fire in the belly to get that person you want elected at least at my municipal level was quite low um, but that being said, uh, the level of disrespect, I would say, is quite high. But I remember, Dad, in your first, not your first campaign, your second campaign, when you were talking about fluoride in the water, and it was these folks that, after debates, would would follow you or ch- like send you angry messages and comment online, really awful things. But I'll I'll let you I'll let you touch on that. But we I, I'm still seeing that all the time, but more so in relation to World Economic Forum, 15 minute cities, all these things that we don't touch and we're not we're not doing that, but we're getting a lot of angry messages about it for sure. I don't think it's a surprise to anyone that social media has really uh, evolved, uh, I would say, since uh, 2013. And uh, that was, you know, when I when I when I was first elected. Right. So um, generally, uh, that was a controversial issue of uh, fluoride. Uh, we've certainly had uh, social issues, which are challenges in the city of Lethbridge. And one of the uh, one of the things is. I always complained about when I was the mayor is why did all the uh, assistants go to Calgary and Edmonton? So the mayors of Calgary and Edmonton, and I got along with those guys, great. But they could make a good case and say, hey, you know, a lot of the social issues in the province um, are coming to our big cities and uh, we need funding to deal with it. And they would get funding for it. They would get subsidized transit grants and things. We never got that kind of assistance in uh, Lethbridge and uh, the mayor of Red Deer would say the same type of things. We were we were large uh, cities, uh, number three and number four in population. We were part of a group. Uh, Airdrie's part of that group too, the Mid-Sized Cities uh, uh, Association. But, you know, we would say as mid-sized cities, our combined population is the same as the Calgary or Edmonton. We are all basically uh, centers. We're, we're focus areas in our regions, but we don't get this kind of, the kind of supports for things like social issues. And then we would have people complaining online that we're not doing anything and uh, we're not fixing, um, you know, the attics in the downtown and we're not fixing uh, poverty or all those types of things. And, and we never got the funding for it, but we certainly got the criticism for it. And uh, when things didn't go well, uh, we were blamed, right? Uh, the, the supervised consumption site in Lethbridge um, they, that was the very first thing that we got. It was federally approved. It was provincially funded. And of course, people resented that. And I said, well, that's the only thing we got funded for. Uh, and it's not actually uh, a municipal responsibility. It's not a municipal decision. It was federally approved. Health care is a provincial issue. But people said, you've got to get it shut down. 
And there was a lot of criticism in my second term about uh, not shutting it down. I was, I was trying to say, hey, we don't have any other supports in this city to deal with this issue. Uh, at least if you have contacts with the addicts, you can refer them to somewhere. Before, they were everywhere. They were in people's basements. They were uh, dying in the parks. At least uh, when, when you're in contact with them, you can get them the support, uh, non-judgmental support. But uh, the, the criticism online for uh, it was formidable, to be, uh, to be fair. And everybody had an opinion. And it was interesting, the people with the strongest opinions, some of them actually ended up running for council themselves in 2021 and did very poorly. Mm. So uh, you, you can take those uh, loud people, loud social media people, if you pay too much attention to them, it can throw you off. And you need to maintain your focus. Uh, you need to maintain, uh, as a mayor, you need to uh, try and, and balance that in your council. And you need to get people uh, supporting everybody working together. And it can throw you off with all the criticism from some loud voices in social media. But when those people try to get elected themselves, they're not successful. You know, they're very strong, very opinionated, and uh, they don't have broad appeal. I'll just pick up on that just a little bit, if I can, too, about like personality types. Chris, if you're the if you're the tree and Heather's the apple that appears not to have fallen too far from that tree, I suspect you still have different personality types, Chris, with you being a Taurus and Heather, you presumably not a Taurus. How do your personality types affect how you tackle issues and this conversation that you have back and forth a little bit? Heather, do you have anything on that? Uh, I think my dad has a lot more patience than I do. Um, I'm still of the mindset that just from my my professional, like my big job, um, everything is on such a tight schedule and you got to move mountains really quickly and get things done. So my mindset is a bit more impulsive, I think. Um, but I think at heart, you know, dad and I, we both really care about our communities and care about kind of the underdog. I think we've always both felt it's important to take care of the most vulnerable people. Um, so in that sense, uh, you know, when dad says that I have strong, strong values, a lot of them, a lot of them come from, from my, my parents and my, my dad specifically when it comes to the political sphere. Um, but I would say, yeah, my dad's a lot more patient and a lot more tolerant and I, I will get there, I'm sure with time, but I'm still in that mode of, you know, I, I, I do get frustrated. I don't necessarily show it all the time, but I do get frustrated with, um, some of the processes and and some of the decisions that get made and it's it's something i'm i'm growing through i'm growing through yeah before you go to your dad do you see a third generation of severmans getting involved in local government <laughs> you should take that one dad <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's a really <laughs> yeah when you have grandkids and you i think the, the thing i enjoy the most about having kids and having grandkids is how unique each and every one is. So, uh, you know, they all have uh, strong personalities and, uh, you know, we'll see how they evolve, you know, uh, they'll, they'll be affected by their environment. They'll be affected as they, you know, their education, how they grow. And uh, we'll see how that works. So uh, I think all, all I can say, uh, you know, one of the most difficult things, and Heather touched on it a, a few minutes ago, uh, you don't win every battle. And even when I was the mayor, there were you know were some things I was passionate about, and uh, I wasn't successful when it came down to the to the votes. And um, and you can't take that personally, and that's easy to say, and many people say it. But sometimes when you lose some of those ones that you feel really strongly about, you know it affects you for a few days. And uh, it takes a little while for you to get over that and uh, get your balance. And I think when, when you're an elected politician and you're working on a board or you're working on a council and uh, you feel strongly about certain issues or if there's a pattern where, you know, you go for two or three meetings and you have a few defeats and uh, on things that you really care about. Uh, those, those are things you just have to keep that energy up and you still have to uh, be able to argue and not be intimidated. And I, and I mean argue in a positive way. I, I guess the proper word is more like debate. You know, it's always important to remember 
that you represent people in the community and those views have to be heard. We used to get uh, professional development training from the uh, Municipalities Association and they would often say the worst votes that you ever have at a council are the ones that are unanimous. Because when views, are, when differing views are not presented during, during the debate at a council meeting, you've done a disservice to the community. So the role of councillors is to make sure that all voices are heard as much as possible. And sometimes that takes a personal toll. Sometimes you, you said, I really fought hard for this nonprofit or for this group, and they didn't get what I think they deserved. And, you know, it takes you a few days to get over that, but remember, uh, that issue will come up again, and next time you might be successful. Well, Heather, Chris, I want to thank you, and I will, uh, both from Ian and myself, for sitting down, taking time out of your busy schedules, uh, and doing this, and helping us better understand the politics of intergenerational intergener politics. So thank you both so much. The full interview with Heather and Chris will be airing next Wednesday, so tune in for that. Uh, and we'll be right back after this quick message. Until then. Abuse against municipal officials, elected and staff members has risen dramatically over the past handful of years, and to date, everyone has been dealing with these issues on their own, and often on a case-by-case -case basis. While we can't eliminate all abuse of officials, we can take steps to mitigate the impact of those instances. On April 27th and April 28th, Strategic Steps Incorporated is hosting a symposium in Edmonton, Alberta, focused on bucking the trend. Attendees will come away with the understanding of fostering a safe space for both administration and council. Learn from industry leaders on how to deal with unsafe and abusive behavior, how to build a supportive team that provides support and you can walk away with the tools and resources to help avoid abuse in local government. Get your tickets today at buckingthetrend.ca. Well, after another great episode, uh, Ian, uh, our chat with uh, Chris and Heather Spearman, we talked about uh, Chestermere, Alberta. We talked about Manitoba, Saskatchewan. Uh, it's another great episode, isn't it? It sure is. It's kind of fun, actually. Now that you mention it, we did kind of go across most of the West. Uh, I was speaking at a bunch of conferences in BC over the last little while, so we can throw that one in there, too. But yeah, this intergenerational thing, I found a really fascinating topic. So uh, with only a month left until our, uh, our big event in Edmonton, Alberta, uh, can you tell us about Bucking the Trend Symposium that's coming up again? Yeah, for sure. Uh, April 27th, 28th uh, in Edmonton, we're looking at uh, dealing with abuse or tackling abuse in the political realm. It is something that has come up fairly frequently. It came up in some of our stories today. It came up in our interview today. And it is a topic which is really resonant and probably not for a good reason. But yeah, it is something we really want to look at and certainly invite people to look at buck buckingthetrend.ca and come out and join us on, the, on those days on the end of April. Highly recommend you get your tickets. I'll be there. I'll be giving a presentation on intersectionality and abuse in the political realm. So until then, I want to thank everyone for tuning in for another great episode of The Political Trenches, Local Government at Work. We will be back in two weeks' time with another great episode, starting with Jay. Till then. Looking forward to it. Thanks, Chris.